So, good morning, Dr. Dabu. Nice that you take your time to do this interview. It would be great if you could introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what your background is. Thank you, Richard, and good morning. Uh, I'm Juan Jose Dabu. I'm originally from El Salvador. I now live in Washington. I'm an engineer, and I have spent about one third of my life in the private sector, about one third of my life in academia, and one third of my life in the public sector. I have the honor of serving as Minister of Finance and in other positions in my country for 12 years without belonging to any political party. Then I joined the World Bank. At the World Bank I was the number two, responsible for operations in 110 countries in Africa, the Middle East, Asia, Latin America uh, and Africa, I think I mentioned. After that, I finished last year, and now I am the CEO, the founding CEO of the Global Adaptation Institute. What is this institute all about? What are the goals and what are the benefits, talking for civil society? The Global Adaptation Institute is about raising the level of awareness and the urgency to act on issues related to adaptation to climate change and other global trends. With population growth, urbanization, economic growth, and the effects of climate change, people need to be prepared to adapt. And we will not wait for a global agreement that's gonna take a lot of time, and I'm not sure what the end result is gonna be. We need to act now, we need to act pragmatically, and we need to bring to the table the private sector, which is why the background and the experience that uh, others that are joining me and myself are bringing to the table. I was just asking, whom are you addressing? Are you addressing governments? Are you addressing companies? Are you addressing civil society? And how? All of them are important, otherwise things don't work. The way we are addressing them is the following. The public sector, we are providing ideas, advice, experiences from many of the people that are with us in the Institute, which includes former presidents and prime ministers, includes 22 of the top 25 scientists of the world dealing in this issue, and includes people that have worked in civil society organizations. And so how do we go about it? We are developing an index, which we will talk about later on. We are also doing outreach, and we are providing financing at zero interest, and in many cases grants, for demonstrative projects that show how local communities can adapt to the effects of climate change. We are focusing on five areas, water, energy, food, agriculture, and coastal protection. What are you funding? Are you funding small companies? We are, we are funding a small and medium-sized enterprises or entrepreneurs that are influencing in their communities the kind of investments that are needed to increase the level of resilience that also work as grassroots support to persuade local and national governments to implement the right public policy. So it is about identifying the vulnerabilities that countries have in those five sectors that I mentioned, but also the level of preparedness, how prepared countries are in terms of education, health, the ease of doing business, institutional capacity, and governance. Do you, I mean, you just started actually, but do you already have an example? Where we, we started in December of last year. Uh, we are unveiling on September the 14th in Washington DC the index which is going to provide some very interesting examples of the conditions of where countries are in terms of their vulnerability and their level of preparedness and before the end of the year we are financing the first three projects uh, in three different uh, continents that actually will show how some very simple almost inexpensive ways of actually creating more resilience with very simple solutions that are available in the private sector that civil society can implement or monitor the effects of their implementation and that governments should be in a position of actually implementing the public policies that are needed to enable the environment for that to happen. Where does the money come from? Private sector. We do not deal with governments. We receive resources, donations that come from the private sector. We were able to raise $10 million as a seed capital from one company who believed in what we are doing. It's called NGP, based in Dallas, Texas. We, as we speak, there are another five prospects that are very likely to come with similar amounts so that we can provide the resources 
to uh, finance the pilot projects to maintain the Global Adaptation Index and to keep a very small and lean organization. It's an organization of 10 people plus advisors and counselors that are helping us uh, throughout the world. You're talking about public-private partnerships, public-private investments. Uh, what is your idea about what is a good investment? How, how are you going to measure this? What are the... We, we, as I was saying before, we are focused on results and on very pragmatic approaches. If investments do not have an attractive return on investment, they won't happen. Are you talking Certainly money wise? Or? Sector, money wise. Now, having said that, we are finding more and more companies that want, of course, to make money to satisfy their stakeholders, and shareholders rather, but also they want to do good in terms of those investments increasing the resilience of countries. Most of the effort so far that has been paid has been on the mitigation front, which is fine and we hope they reach the proper objectives. We are working on adaptation, which is a parallel track that says we might miss the targets on the mitigation front, so what do we have to do in order to avoid catastrophe, in order to lose more lives or more important, or as important, to uh, lose the livelihoods of people, especially vulnerable people. And this is important. We are focusing in developing countries. Even though our work and our index also covers developed countries, we will provide resources exclusively to developing countries. Don't, I mean, we have also this, this ongoing discussion out there, I say, in the world, uh, separating companies from so or enterprises from so-called social enterprises. I mean, when you are saying you are funding companies' projects for doing good, not only receiving return on investment or looking at return on investment money-wise, do you think this term social enterprise is actually contradiction in words? Do we need social enterprises or shouldn't be each and every company well, a social enterprise in, in the way you were just trying to explain. Yes, well, first of all, I believe that uh, the free market is extremely important uh, and I think the companies are realizing more and more that they need to have healthy societies and good communities around their corporations and their business and their work, where their workers live in order to have success. But I'm not speaking about corporate social responsibility. I'm speaking very bluntly about being able to invest in seeds, in fertilizers, in land, in land titling, in agriculture, in coastal protection. And there should be a reasonable return on investment while also achieving the goals of increasing resilience. And as I was saying before, the number of companies that are interested in doing this is growing up. I met with 27 uh, very large companies at, at Davos in January of this year that are either already working or have in their budget already for this year to work on these areas. So you are actually supporting this idea how people to help themselves in kind of development aid? I think, to speak. I, I think that's very important. I do not, and we do not believe in handouts. We believe in opportunities. We believe in removing obstacles so that people can take destiny into their own hands. For that to happen, there needs to be enough information, there needs to be institutions that work, there needs to be security. People have to have access to knowledge and technology to be able to succeed. Humans historically have been able to adapt to the most adverse conditions when they are in freedom because they can create and they can innovate. So we are about trying to remove those obstacles that allow for people to actually pursue what is in their best interest, recognizing that in many countries the obstacles come from the kind of public sector or the kind of public structure or the excessive regulation or the lack of security that exists. And so that needs to be addressed. So, and the index you're going to publish in September will help you to do so? Yes. The Global Adaptation Index, which we are publishing in the next few weeks, basically measures the vulnerabilities that countries have in terms of the five sectors that I mentioned before and how prepared they are to address the challenges of the effects of climate change and other global trends. To induce leaders in the public sector to implement the right public policies, 
and leaders in the private sector to actually make the investments that are needed. There are between 100 and 200 billion dollars a year that are needed for the next 30 years just to keep up with the needs on adaptation. That is not going to come from taxes, that's not going to come from government, that's not going to come from multilateral institutions. Less than 20% of that is estimated to be able to come from those sources. So the other 80% is going to have to come from the private sector. And when I speak about the private sector, I'm not speaking only about the Fortune 500 of the largest companies of the world. I'm speaking about that small enterprise, that small entrepreneur that is actually creating a lot of jobs, 90% of the jobs, 98% of the jobs created in the world are created by small and medium-sized enterprises, and it is there where we are focusing our energy. So, what does the index do? The index ranks countries in terms of where they are. It ranks them in a way that creates competition among them, and so if a country is ranked number 17, and its neighboring country is ranked number two or three in the world, we want to create a positive momentum which translates into actually, as I was saying before, implementing the right public policies in water, in energy, in yeah. coastal protection, in terms of having more access to the market. So we are working or we are identifying companies in Africa, for example, that are using very simple text messaging to actually provide information to the farmers as to what is the price of the product they yes. are selling or what is the weather like because the patterns of weather have changed from what their grandparents and their parents used to recognize. So yes. the index is a navigation chart, it's a tool for decision makers in the private and in the public sector to prioritize investments and to attract investments from the private sector to developing countries that can have a good return while at the same time making good. How do you provide the, the data? Is it open data? It's open data. We That's what you learned from the World five, Bank? <laughs> <laughs> we have collected half a million uh, pieces of information from 24 indicators on the vulnerability part and 11 indicators on the readiness part from data that exists from the last 15 years. So, so we, we can, can also track and see how countries have evolved in each of the variables in that period of time. But not only that, we are also adjusting it according to the GDP of each country. And that brings fantastic surprises. Countries that you wouldn't think about being in the top 10 are actually in the top 10. And the data is really open? So it's, it's really open. That's okay. actually how we got it, got it. And that's how we are putting it available in our new website, which will be unveiled also yeah. at the same time that we uh, are unveiling the index in the next few weeks. When we finish the interview, I will tell you something. And please remind me. I think this could perfectly fit in there. All right. So my very last question would be, since we are here at the Salzburg Trilog, how could this index, how could the work of your institute fit into this idea of a greater we, of something like I mean, politicians, companies are saying there is a need for, for global governance, that we have to find global commons. Uh, how does this idea fit in there and what do you think? Well, then? the Global Adaptation Institute, as the name implies, is an institution that tries to encompass or take into account what is happening around the world, but again with a very pragmatic look at it. Even though I believe it's a great endeavor to try to achieve global consensus on several topics which are extremely important like health, security, the respect of rule of law. Uh, it is actually in practice very difficult simply because of where each of us come from, where the level of development of each country is and the needs each country has. So when I used to go to Africa and I would talk about climate change, they would say, look, less than 20% of, of my population have access to energy. How much more can we do? So we have to be reasonable about the realities and therefore the message I bring is that even though it is a good objective to search for consensus, we should aim for convergence of ideas and recognize the strengths and weaknesses of each of the nations, both in the public sector and in the private sector, and how you can help remove the obstacles 
that actually will raise the level of awareness, of understanding, and more importantly, of development that the countries need. And I believe that it is the aggregate. In other words, it is, it is actually people at the grassroots level who adapt and actually should bring the ideas and the convergence of those ideas at the highest level. We just went through three crises, a financial crisis, a fuel crisis, and a food crisis since 2008 what? until today. Some 60 million new people are living in poverty. This is on top of the 1.4 billion people living wow. with less than a dollar a quarter a day. So how can we improve the situation? How can we avoid these things to keep happening? I think information is important. I think minimizing regulation and maximizing competition it is, is important. And as I was saying before, removing the obstacles that allow people to be more innovative and, and more creative. We shouldn't let, and I have been in government for many years, I have been at the World Bank for many years, we shouldn't leave those important decisions to politicians. They are too important to be left to politicians. They should be in the hands of the people. And to an extent, the Global Adaptation Institute has the opportunity of bringing the voice of those in developing countries that are relatively vulnerable to actually be heard and to actually participate. And that's why I thank the trilogue for inviting me this year to participate. I bring a message of let's do things that are pragmatic, that are realistic, not dogmatic, or that are based on agendas that are unrealistic for developing countries that have so many challenges that, are, uh, uh, that need to be addressed. So are you basically saying that politicians have failed in doing what so? I'm saying and that you're saying we really need a civil society stand up and... What I'm saying is that uh, most politicians are thinking about the next election and not the next generation. We need leaders that are thinking about the next generation. Otherwise, we're going to become a world that is going to f be full of, uh, of challenges that would be very difficult to manage. And so we need to live with that reality, but in as much as we can, we should try to change it in a way that reflects better the interests and the needs of people. And it is very much important to say the following. I believe that it is better to have an imperfect market than a perfect bureaucrat telling us what to do. What is an imperfect market? Well, markets are not perfect because there is not necessarily enough information available or you or I will have different access to information. A farmer in a remote area in Malawi or in El Salvador, my country, does not have the same kind of information that a large corporation would have. There is nothing wrong with, with the, the opportunity that a large corporation has. So how can we use the technology that is available, the knowledge that is available to make that farmer have access to the same knowledge and the same technology and the same applies to that student in a, in a remote mountain in Laos or in Cambodia or in Bangladesh or in Sri Lanka. It should have, and actually now with technology it is much easier to have the same access that Friends of yours and my children who live in Washington, in my case, have access every day. So that's the sort of things we are looking at. Are you on Twitter? I'm in most of the social media options that are there. Yeah, so short answers to two questions. Twitter, Twitter answers, okay? Yes. What is your understanding of we? Work, working people working people uh, that want to achieve the best uh, access to knowledge, a convergence of ideas. And when we talk about we, I am talking about people that faces challenges every day, but that have the means to overcome them. And we means helping remove those obstacles that create an imbalance, imbalances that exist in developing countries, but also in developed countries. And what are the major challenges we are facing right now? Economic, even economic growth, population growth, urbanization, 70% of the population of the world is going to live in urban cities and less than 100 kilometers from the shoreline, and the effects of climate change. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ulrich. I appreciate this and I wish you all the best. Thank you.